So it has just turned 12 o'clock on my clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Joe, um, I want to thank you all for joining us today for the UVM Extension New Farmer Webinar Series presentation on poultry production. Joe Emanizer, who is a livestock specialist with UVM Extension, is talking with us today. Um, I want to share a few housekeeping notes with you. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat room so Joe can address them at an appropriate time during the presentation. Please take a moment to share your email address with us in the chat room if you'd like to be added to the New Farmer Network. And uh, also we'll be providing a link at the, uh, to a survey at the end of the presentation. So please be sure to visit that link to share your feedback about the session. During this webinar, Joe will introduce some basics of chicken biology and how to apply them to ensure healthy, productive birds. This discussion will focus on the digestive and reproductive systems along with some basics of chicken behavior. Joe was raised on a small family farm in Pennsylvania. His livestock experience is diverse and includes managing sheep farms in New York, butchering, genetic evaluation, teaching, and judging. Through his work with UVM Extension, Joe seeks to help Vermont's diversified livestock farms improve their efficiency, product quality, and marketing. So once again, thank you for all who have joined us. And Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you. OK, well, thank you, Heidi. And uh, looks like the winter weather has uh, our numbers down. But uh, the good thing is this will be recorded. So I'm just going to emphasize what Heidi said, that uh, if you have questions, please type them into the box. Uh, it's it's tough uh, for those of us giving a, a webinar in a closed room and only getting to hear ourselves to uh, feel like we're interacting sometimes. So uh, feel free to use that. It helps me, and I think it helps us all. Uh, and so I have a slide similar to uh, Heidi's, except that you get to see my smiling mug on there. And um, in general, I just wanted to uh, address many of the calls that I get uh, to this office from uh, backyard to medium scale poultry producers um, that I think can be addressed in general by by looking at the biology of of the chicken um, and and using that understanding of those systems to uh, imply management practices that that are better or worse um, and the two systems like I said will focus on uh, on digestion and reproduction, uh, digestion or nutrition being the, the primary inputs of the chicken, and reproduction uh, being the primary outputs. Um, and I'll have a heavy emphasis on egg production here, uh, but certainly can venture into uh, meat birds if, if there's desire to. Um, and then all animals have behavior, and chickens certainly have some unique behaviors that, that make them um, both interesting and fun. Uh, and, and also sometimes challenging to manage. Um, so before I get started too far, uh, just some basic terminology that um, that I think is important to go over and make sure everyone is on the same page. Uh, female chickens are called hens or pullets. Uh, and definitions vary somewhat, but, uh, but for my purposes, a pullet uh, ceases being a pullet at one year of age, at which point she becomes a hen, uh, and generally she's been laying for uh, for several months at that point. Uh, male birds are called cocks or cockerels, uh, separated again by that one year of age mark. Um, and then chicks uh, are, is, is ambiguous, but can apply to either sex, and generally uh, refer to a pullet chick or a cockerel chick. Uh, if, if I need to differentiate them by sex. Uh, one ground rule there, um, some people shy away from uh, the male terminology for various reasons, but uh, and, and so rooster is certainly uh, an acceptable slang. Um, but when rooster gets shortened to roo, that tends to irritate those of us that, that, that approach this uh, scientifically. So might want to refrain from that particular terminology. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, just some interesting history on the domestication of chickens. Um, genetic testing has shown that they've all descended from jungle fowl, specifically the red jungle fowl, uh, which was native to Southeast Asia. Um, 
reports vary on exactly when uh, domestication occurred, and I think it probably occurred in several instances. Um, but we know that uh, domestic chickens have been part of human society for at least 4,000 years. Um, and interestingly, although our primary uses at this time are for eggs and for meat, uh, it appears that but the primary purpose for domesticating chickens was for sport, and, and their use in cockfighting was primary, with uh, meat and egg production being secondary products at best. Uh, certainly that has changed, but just an interesting piece of, of history that kind of underscores some of the behaviors that we'll talk about later. Um, when we think about the history of poultry production, uh, particularly in the States, we envision the farm flocks that existed in the, uh, the early part of the 20th century prior to the Industrial uh, Revolution and the, the growth of the commercial industries. Um, and in terms of small-scale production, as we see here in, in Vermont and a large volume of my calls uh, come from, um, there's some pretty strong parallels between those dynamics now and, and the farm flocks of the early part of the 20th century. However, um, we can get a biased view, I think, that, that chickens were always used for production, um, and that wasn't certainly the case. Uh, even during that farm flock time, um, chickens were primarily used for eggs. Uh, the dual purpose idea is really a bit of a misnomer. Uh, where the majority of, of meat chickens, at least at that time, were simply old uh, old stewing hens. We struggle with that dual purpose a little bit now uh, because the older stewing hens take longer to cook, and we have uh, some different approaches to food now. Um, another interesting tidbit of history there is that our emphasis on or our use of chickens throughout history has certainly not been entirely for production. Uh, and during the mid-1800s, uh, there was what was referred to as the hen craze, which saw a lot of importations of Asiatic breeds uh, for primarily ornamental purposes. That kind of gave rise to what was referred to as uh, the poultry fancy, or fancy poultry, um, which is now still continued in, in exhibition poultry, and uh, that is what has preserved a lot of these purebred heritage strains. Uh, and around the 1950s, uh, or certainly by the 1950s, the commercial industry had separated from the, the original purebred heritage breeds, and also recognized the inefficiencies of, of trying to produce both meat and eggs from the same birds. Uh, so we now have the commercial broiler industry and the commercial layers, uh, which are which are separate. But chickens are the most common bird worldwide. There's over 25 billion of them, um, and that's more than three times the number of humans. If we ever have any fear of being taken over, uh, one point that I'd like to really emphasize about this, which doesn't dig into the biology, but I think it's critically important. Um, is that the most important key to success of, of a poultry or any operation is matching the animals that you're using uh, to the environment and the resources that you have available to the purpose for which those animals uh, are being used, the, the products that are being marketed. Uh, and a lot of the calls that I receive uh, just grow out of mismatches, uh, for example, using commercial broilers uh, in a very extensive system and expecting them to live much longer than they were ever intended to. Um, and then different breeds have different levels of productivity and so on and so forth. Uh, so just give some, some very careful thought to what breeds you're using and what system you're using them in. And a lot of this uh, other discussion is secondary to that. Uh, but all chickens have basically the same biology, and we're going to dig into that and uh, give some implications. Um, I think the digestive system is probably 
the most important uh, in terms of management and, and understanding implications for nutrition. Um, the first point that I'd like to make is that chickens are omnivores and always have been. Uh, they eat a mix of plant and, uh, and animal proteins. Uh, a free-ranging chicken is far from uh, vegetarian when we consider the amount of bugs and, and worms and uh, other critters that they consume. And so I think that uh, some of the buzz that we see about vegetarian chicken diets uh, is either inaccurate uh, or irresponsible uh, in, in terms of animal welfare. Second point is that chickens are monogastrics. Uh, that means that unlike ruminants, uh, or cattle or sheep, they don't have a rumen to digest cellulose. Uh, and so that the energy sources that they can convert are much lower in fiber. And in general, put chickens more in competition with humans uh, for the foodstuffs that that they make most use of. Their digestive system is more similar to ours anyway than a ruminant. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And another uh, kind of defining characteristic of the chicken digestive system is that they don't have teeth. Uh, they certainly use their mouth and beak to uh, to pick various feedstuffs, but they don't have the ability to chew it. And so uh, they use a combination of, of chemical and mechanical digestion later in the process to, uh, to get the job done. And if we look at the diagram here on the right-hand side, uh, food is prehended in the mouth or, or with the beak goes through the esophagus to the crop. Uh, the crop is the first stopping point in, in the digestive system, but it's really not uh, much more than the storage component. Uh, when the crop becomes full, uh, or, or, or when, when the contents of the crop empty, send signals to the brain, uh, hunger signals, to consume more feed, and and so the, the crop is basically functioning as a storage unit. There are some issues with, uh, with the crop that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but then from the crop, uh, food continues to the proventriculus, which is the, the glandular stomach. Um, and that's where digestive en enzymes uh, start to break down, break down the feed. Uh, at which time it then goes to the gizzard. The gizzard is uh, two large muscles, pound for pound. They're uh, the strongest muscle in, in the chicken's body. Uh, there's also uh, grit that accumulates in the gizzard, and that action uh, helps to mechanically break down uh, the feedstuff, at which point it then goes to the uh, the intestines and the rest of the chain where the nutrients are absorbed and water is absorbed and uh, we could get into great detail about some interesting things about the, the chicken digestive system uh, but basically understanding the role of the crop uh, the proventriculus as a granular as a glandular stomach and the gizzard as a mechanical stomach uh, is the, the primary goal. Um, nutritionally, there are several nutrients that are that are critically important. Uh, not all of them are listed here, but I wanted to highlight a few. Uh, carbohydrates are energy. Uh, energy is responsible for growth or, or really any sustenance of life, and so it could be argued that, that they're most important. Um, proteins. Are, are important for skeletal muscle growth um, and the maintenance of metabolism. One thing that I'd like to say about proteins is that on our feed bags, we usually see a crude protein measurement. Uh, crude protein is just that. It is a crude measurement. Uh, and commercial poultry rations 
excuse me, com uh, commercial poultry rations are formulated not on a crude protein basis generally, but on the amino acids that are the building blocks of protein. Lysines and thionines are generally the, uh, the limiting amino acids, and so when we really drill down into uh, to poultry nutrition, we can do better than crude protein. Minerals and vitamins are, are important to support metabolism, as we know. Uh, just a couple of basic ones to, to touch on there. One of the most important minerals for, uh, for laying poultry is calcium. Uh, the eggshell is high in calcium content, and the eggshell or the calcium that's used for eggshell comes from the, the bird's skeletal system uh, so that it needs to have enough dietary calcium to support a strong skeleton to be able to continue to lay uh, well-shelled eggs. Uh, it's possible to feed too much calcium to young birds and disrupt their skeletal growth, uh, and it's possible to feed too much calcium to birds from which we're hoping to hatch eggs and make those eggshells too hard for chicks to hatch. Uh, so understanding how to balance calcium is, is pretty important. Uh, vitamins are also important and without getting, uh, without belaboring that, I think one of the biggest vitamin challenges is during the winter, uh, particularly if we're normally in a free ranging opportunity where uh, birds can get out and, and eat greenery. Uh, that's generally more limited uh, for the next few months, and, and so something that we need to pay attention to uh, with various supplementation. And then the most important nutrient of all is water. Uh, without water, none of the rest of the digestion can take place, and, and, and birds can go much longer without food than they can without water. Uh, and so if we miss feeding them for a day or two days or uh, even a week, really not creating much damage, but uh, and they won't be happy with us, but, but physiologically we're not creating much damage, whereas water-wise uh, a bird needs to have pretty much unlimited access to water all the time. Uh, so this time of year when there's any threat of freezing and those sorts of things, we have to be very careful uh, about that. And probably the most important nutrition point that I'd like to make is the importance of grit. Uh, grit, as we talked about, is used in tandem with the gizzard uh, or the ventriculus is the technical name to, to further grind up the feed. Uh, a couple points about grit. The stone or the mineral from which that grit is made is very important. Um, some minerals are insoluble, which means that they persist longer uh, in the stomach or, or in the digestive system. Uh, and some are soluble, which means that they're absorbed by the body much faster. Calcium is an example of that, and so if we're using calcium, uh, in the form of oyster shell and trying to double that as a grit source, it's really not terribly effective um, if we're trying to break down hard seeds and, and grasses. Uh, most commercial poultry rations are that the particle size is fine enough that grit is really not highly necessary, um, but still important to provide and a bird will self-regulate on what it needs. The other important point about grit is that it comes, or that it be supplied in the appropriate size. Uh, in general, the rule of thumb is to feed the largest size possible uh, that the birds will eat because that is most effective in terms of digestion. Uh, there, there is baby chick grit, there is grower grit. Uh, and then there's layer size grit and sometimes some intermediate sizes. Uh, but we need to make sure that the, the size of the grit that's being supplied uh, is in line with 
the bird's ability to consume it and then their nutritional needs. As I alluded to, uh, a couple of digestive disorders that, that I've gotten calls about uh, since I've gotten in this position, uh, probably the first and foremost is croc impaction, uh, which is a situation where perhaps the bird has been or hasn't eaten for a long period of time, is hungry, goes out, gorges it, itself, and fills that, that crop over full. Uh, which then impedes the ability for the crop to empty uh, further into the uh, further down the esophagus and then into the the proventriculus. Um, also, long grasses, as are shown in the uh, picture on the right here, can lead to crop impaction. The bird does secrete a little bit of salivary uh, enzymes in. in in saliva from the mouth, uh, but obviously not enough to, to break down large blades of grass, uh, and so that particle size can prevent some or can present some challenges. Another thing to be wary of uh, is sharp objects like tacks or nails or staples uh, in, in or around chicken houses. Uh, when the bird consumes them, they are not absorbed and they, they then can create damage to the, the wall of the gizzard, uh, which then impedes the ability of the gizzard to function in, in reducing particle size further. And then, as I uh, alluded to before, in the point that water is the most important nutrient, um, dehydration is probably the number one uh, digestive disorder that I deal with. So moving on to the reproductive system, uh, a couple important points, and this will focus mostly on the female uh, reproductive system for now. Um, chickens are precocial, which means that when chicks are hatched, they, they don't require a great deal of care from their mother uh, in terms of feeding um, as compared to a parrot or a pigeon. Um, they do require brooding. Uh, for some period of time, and, and that's why we see pictures of, of hens huddled into the mothers, or we use brooders uh, to provide an artificial heat source in the industry. Um, but that, that precociality is one point that separates chickens uh, from some other bird species. They are also clutch, nature, clutch layers by nature, which means that a hen will lay a clutch of eggs, uh, a certain number which might be eight, it might be ten, it might be six, it depends on the hen and her layer of, of, of production, uh, at which time she stops laying and devotes herself to brooding, uh, well, to hatching and, and brooding those eggs. Um, one of the things that was done or, or that was needed to be done to make commercial layers more productive was to overcome the tendency to be clutch layers uh, and to overcome the tendency toward broodiness. That's why birds that are more uh, legern based, for example, um, which are offsets of, of the commercial industry, are less inclined uh, to go broody and they're more inclined to lay larger numbers of eggs throughout the year. When a pullet is hatched, uh, all of the ova that that she will have in her lifetime uh, are with her at that time. And those numbers are in excess of 10,000. Uh, obviously, it's, it's not likely that the hen will get even close to producing the number of eggs that she could in her lifetime. Um, but they're all there in various sizes. Uh, and actually, that is one of the challenges uh, when it comes to processing spent hens under inspection is all of those unlaid eggs or, or unlaid, undeveloped ova that are in the body cavity uh, and are considered a contaminant if they get on, on the outside of, of a carcass. Um, 
and I wish I had a, a good picture to show you a bunch of, uh, of ova inside a, a hen, but they do look like the, uh, the ova that are shown up here at the top above the infundibulum of this reproductive system. And so basically there's two parts, the ovary itself, which becomes the egg, and the oviduct, which uh, is the, the series of glands through which the, the egg develops and is deposited uh, deposited with, with various uh, parts and pieces to the point that it's finally developed in the uterus or shell gland where that calcified shell is, is put on uh, and then goes from there to laying. Um, the process of ovulation takes between 25 to 26 hours um, on average in chickens. Uh, so a hen begins to ovulate the next egg approximately one hour after she lays the first one, with the exception that uh, not much ovulation occurs late in the afternoon or when it's dark. Uh, and so that's why we see as a hen laying time creeps later and later in the day. At some point she will likely skip. Uh, and wait to ovulate until the following morning, which puts her on a later schedule. Um, so there's a whole range of abnormalities that can occur from abnormal ovulation, um, and we could we could go into great detail about them here, but uh, there are good resources available, and, and I'm happy to work through some of those troubleshooting instances. Um, but if we think about the process, it's perhaps more understandable uh, how things like double yolked eggs can occur when, when two ova uh, are ovulated at the same time. Um, misshapen eggs or thin eggs uh, are generally problems in, with calcification in the uterus or shell gland. And and then one of the most interesting things, which isn't necessarily an abnormality, but a difference among eggs, is the color of egg. And the reality uh, of the difference between brown eggs and white eggs is that brown eggs get an extra coat of spray paint in the last few hours of the process. Um, and so nutritionally, there's absolutely no difference between the two. Uh, just difference in genetics causing uh, causing that brown color deposition. Uh, the blue egg gene is, is, is a separate one. And if we see green eggs, basically a green egg is a blue egg on a brown shell. Uh, and the difference between the shades of brown is because of the various number of genes that control that. Um, but in reality, like I said, it's really just different amounts of paint. Um, one of the most important things about chickens is their sensitivity to light um, relative to their reproduction. And this controls everything from male fertility to female laying. Um, and I just wanted to go through quickly uh, an, an overview of this. And again, I have more in-depth resources with lighting protocols uh, for those who are interested. Uh, but if we look at the, the top option here, for example, um, the photo period for laying hens uh, has increased a maximum of 16 to 17 hours. Uh, I generally say 15 when I'm making recommendations. Um, but if you'll notice that Day length is increased uh, from the from the growing stage after the hen comes into lay, and that is what prompts her to to stay in lay is that increase in day length. Um, in the second option, as those pullets are developing, we're actually decreasing the day length, uh, which keeps them. Uh, from laying until they've reached the appropriate size. 
commercially, we restrict the point of lay for several reasons. One, um, those younger hens are, are more prone to reproductive disorders uh, such as prolapses or uh, or retained eggs that can can cause them trouble. But then also from a marketing standpoint, uh, the eggs from younger hens are very small. And so if we don't want them to to lay until they've reached a certain size and they can produce at least a medium egg, uh, that increases their value and it also uh, tends to increase their longevity. So um, suffice it to say that, that the amount of lighting that's provided in, in day length can be pretty critically important to maintaining a laying hen and also developing a growing hen. And a lot of the, the challenges um, that I see with, with pullets that are purchased and so forth just come from improper backgrounding of light and then they get into a, a completely new situation that throws them off. Uh, and, and to follow up on that point, a uh, general rule of thumb in terms of laying houses is that if you can read a newspaper uh, in all corners of the house, it's bright enough. It doesn't have to be uh, intense light. And most people don't think in terms of foot candles. So the rule of thumb generally works pretty well. Um, and there's a couple more interesting points we'll make about that here in a bit. Um, so the, the number one call that I get about chickens is why aren't my hens laying? And this just went through uh, day length is probably the most important. Uh, some people have blamed it on the time change, but uh, I've assured them that chickens can't read clocks, that it's just a matter of the days getting shorter this time of year. Nutrition is another big one, and the chicken will regulate its reproduction if its nutritional needs aren't being, aren't being met. Um, disease is, is big, and a lot of the diseases have similar symptoms uh, and can occur at the same time. So sometimes that's challenging to diagnose. Um, the best method of controlling disease in a poultry operation is to bring in clean birds and to maintain a closed flock. Uh, understanding that there is always potential for bugs to come in uh, you know, through migratory birds or through the, the wind and, and so on and so forth. But if we can minimize the amount of, of direct contact with new birds, we can control diseases fairly effectively. Um, age is big, and most birds have the ability to to be reasonably productive for two laying cycles. Um, after that point, there's a lot of genetic differences in, in their longevity. And even the birds that do live longer, uh, their production decreases with age. Uh, stress is huge, and, and birds are finicky if there's a change in environment, if there's predation, uh, or if there is feed or water limitation, uh, they will withhold their laying. Uh, molting is a very natural thing, part of the, the, the body's production cycle, where they lay eggs for a certain period of time, then molt, bring in a new change of feathers. They drop a lot of body condition uh, at that time, but then build it back up, which is part of the rejuvenation or recharging process to go through it again. Broodiness, as we talked about, uh, has genetic variants, and when a hen is broody, uh, she is geared toward setting eggs and raising chicks and not, not laying. And so there are various methods to, to break up broodiness um, should that occur. But commercially, the, the method that's been used is to been, has been to select against it uh, and kind of underscored all the genetic uh, rationale for each of these points as I've gone through them. Uh, so finally, a couple of, of important points about behavior of chickens. By nature, they're prey animals. Um, 
and so their entire life is pretty much devoted to protecting themselves and being aware of predators. They have uh, an amazing field of vision as a result of that, uh, and they can see many things that we can't. Um, birds don't have the ability to, or, or chickens don't have the ability to maintain sustained flight, uh, but they certainly use flight ability as a defense mechanism. And different birds have different body masses, different abilities to fly. Uh, all of that is reflected uh, in the proportion of the, the breast muscles to the rest of the body size and mass. Um, and then another important behavior that if you've been around chickens long enough um, becomes very obvious is vocalization. And uh, one of the principal roles of, of a rooster, of a male in, in a flock, is to keep an eye out for, uh, for predators and sound that warning call um, when something is seen. Uh, but hens are also quite vocal, and generally when there's cackling, it means that either somebody laid an egg or there's a problem in the coop. Um, societally, chickens have a very strong pecking order, and that's part of, of the nature of the beast. Um, and so understanding how to manage that, uh, I think, is is challenging when we have birds that come in from new environments uh, and we introduce you know, young pullets into a group of older hens, for example, uh, we can expect that the young ones will get pretty beat up for a while. Uh, so doing things like introducing birds at night uh, rather than in the middle of the day can help to mitigate that, uh, providing plenty of space and providing, making sure that there's, there's options for food and water uh, for the birds that, that are lower in the pecking order helps to avoid some problems. Uh, again, chickens are very, are very stress prone when it comes to laying, and so minimizing the things that we do, uh, particularly during the middle of the day when they're focused on laying eggs, uh, that can disrupt their, their normal cycle is important to to keeping them on track, and uh, when when birds get stressed, that's when we have things like an egg that is withheld from laying for for a long period of time. Thus, it might be overcalcified, or it might uh, end up being retained, or uh, or so on and so forth. So, minimizing stress from us and from predators uh, is important to productivity. Uh, Chicks have their own set of, uh, of behaviors which kind of follow suit with the pecking order. Uh, they're, they're curious by nature, um, but there are some things that chicks have to be taught, and one of them is how to drink water. Uh, chickens are not naturally, or chicks are not naturally attracted to a flat sheet of water uh, unless there's bubbles or something that they become curious and, and peck at. And so if you bring a, a new group of baby chicks in, one of the best things to do is just quickly go through and dip each one of their beaks in the water uh, and train them to drink, which is what their mother would do ordinarily. Um, and then the majority of the discussions that I have about chicken behavior uh, revolve around males. And males are are a challenge um, to maintain in in a flock setting, but they also, like I say, play an important role, particularly if we want to have viable chicks. Um, but we do have to understand that males are territorial. They have uh, they have a strong pecking order, and they do have fighting instincts, although those instincts vary with breed. Um, but those are the very things for which they were originally domesticated. And so um, 
understanding how to manage aggressive males uh, is one of the greatest challenges that, that seems to be faced in small flocks. And um, in my opinion, I have no time for a, a human aggressive male bird that is a recipe for soup or rooster enchiladas real quickly. And when we get on the, the internet, we can read all sorts of things about um, how to calm male chickens down and how to uh, supersede them in the hierarchy. And, and a lot of that is nonsense. Uh, the differences in male aggression are genetic. And when we have aggressive males, uh, we have a genetic problem that, that realistically we can't change by any other means than, than removing them from the gene pool. Um, Temperature-wise, uh, I saw that our guest from Florida left, so I can go back to talking about mostly winter stress. Uh, chicken's body temperature is quite high, uh, around 105 degrees Fahrenheit, but that varies. Um, However, they become susceptible to heat stress um, as low as 80 degrees and certainly by 85. And they don't have a great deal of mechanisms uh, by which to combat heat. You see the buff uh, hen in the right-hand side here is holding her wings outstretched and open mouth, uh, open mouth breathing. And that helps, uh, so certainly packing chickens to the point that they cannot expand um, their ribs or cannot uh, outstretch their wings uh, adds to heat stress if we're not in a temperature controlled environment. Um, but again, the most critical piece of, of temperature regulation or thermal regulation is uh, what we see in the foreground in that picture, and that's water and providing cool water uh, to chickens in, in heat stress is the number one thing uh, to keep them from overheating. In the winter, uh, feathers provide an excellent insulation source. And we'll, if we look at birds that have differing abilities to withstand cold, one of the things that we observe is a difference in the proportion of, of down on the feather. Uh, birds that tend to be have more down are fluffier. And, and they tend to do better over the winter. Uh, however, that, that same insulative factor uh, keeps them from staying cool in the summer. And so it goes back to the point about matching breeds to the environment. And uh, we probably wouldn't, it would not be wise to, uh, to bring a breed selected for heat tolerance. Um, into Vermont in the winter and expected to uh, to produce eggs well. Uh, and then another critical temperature point is uh, in the context of brooding baby chicks. Uh, baby chicks are not hatched with the ability to regulate their own body temperature. And that's why an artificial heat source has to be provided um, for several weeks, at least, with, with uh, declining temperature over that time. But if we look at the diagram in the lower right-hand corner, um, we can see some various distribution patterns that, uh, that behaviorally show the chick's uh, response to the temperature in the brooder. And on the left-hand side, um, those chicks being scattered throughout, kind of moving in and, and away from the, the heat source at their own will, uh, chirping constantly, that, that temperature is just right. Uh, when they're all huddled in the center under the heat source, uh, the temperature is too low and um, we run the risk of, of them piling on each other at that time and, and causing various issues. Uh, in the, the next instance, the temperature is too high and thus the chicken Chicks are all uh, scattered to the outside trying to get away from the heat source. Uh, this is an example of why brooder pens should be round rather than, than square at the corners. 
uh, because if we have an instance where the temperature rises too high, and it happens sometimes uh, even outside of our control, um, and chicks pile into a corner, we, we suffocate, or many of them suffocate, and that's not a good thing, obviously. And then the final uh, instance just shows a draft where there's a, a point in the brooder where uh, a breeze is coming through uh, or some sort of draft and, and the, the chicks are piled to get away from that. Uh, so if we learn to understand these distribution patterns and how to manage temperature accordingly, I think uh, that's one of the most important lessons uh, in the context of chick behavior. Uh, there are a couple of random facts that, you know, when I'm putting this together, I, I stumble upon things and, and I learn things too. Um, chickens have amazing power to uh, detect UV rays uh, and their, their light spectrum is different than ours. They can see uh, with far greater intensity and, and a, a broader spectrum than we can. Uh, one really interesting fact in that is that a mother hen has the ability, uh, well, because feathers um, give off UV rays uh, during growth, a mother hen has the ability to look at a clutch of chicks and differentiate which chicks are thriving and which chicks are not and devote more attention to the ones that are thriving uh, just in terms of resource allocation, uh, kind of selective rearing, and that's that's a function of her ability to detect, detect the UV uh, rays of the feathers. Another interesting thing is that uh, when chicks are born, they uh, they have their head, or when they're hatched, they have their head tucked to the right, um, or excuse me, to the left, and their right eye is against the the shell of the egg, um, and so it is more sensitive to light during that time, or given more light during that time, and uh, and that eye becomes nearsighted. That's the eye that the, the chicken uses to uh, search for food, whereas the left eye has more farsightedness, and that's what a chicken uses to uh, to watch for predators. And that's why when a uh, hawk flies overhead, for example, the chickens will cock their head to the right and, and look up with their left eye. Um, and then one more fascinating fact, I spent a lot of time talking about light. Uh, chickens don't actually uh, absorb that light through their eye. Uh, it, it's through the pineal gland of the brain. And there have been studies that, that have shown that, uh, that blind chickens uh, have just as much light sensitivity uh, as chickens with, with full vision. So uh, that's a little bit counterintuitive and it, I was late learning that. Um, but as important as light is, it's really not uh, a factor of, of chickens' vision. And that sums up the list of things that I had to go through. I kept this really basic with the hope that it would stimulate some questions. Um, and so if there are any specific things to, uh, to ask or dig farther in, feel free to type them into the chat window there on the bottom left. And while I'm waiting for that, uh, I'll just make a couple of points here. This session was recorded. Uh, the website that that can be accessed at is the link up at the top. And we'd also ask that you complete the survey uh, to give us information and feedback on, on how we can do better uh, with the survey monkey link there on the second blue. I'm not seeing any chat comments. Does anyone have any questions uh, about things that were or weren't addressed? Uh, 
great question, George, and I actually intended to, to go through that a little bit um, in more detail during the presentation, so thank you for reminding me. The question is, uh, do free-range chickens get grit from the ground, and do they pass grit and constantly need more? And the answer is yes. Um, the, a couple points to make there. Um, commercial grit that we buy is, uh, is generally flint or granite based, and one of the reasons for that is uh, that it is mineral neutral um, and, and less soluble than many of the other uh, naturally occurring stones that we have in this area or any other area. Uh, and where that becomes important is that those insoluble grits um, number one, last longer, but also don't contribute as much mineralization to the nutrition of the chicken. So uh, with that in mind, if we have free range chickens that are out in the pasture and they're just getting their grit from the stones that are in that environment, uh, their mineral nutrition will be limited by the mineral deficiencies of, of the soil that they're on. Uh, so that's one thing to to keep in mind, uh, and and the rate at which they pass that grit or dissolve that grit and and need more is really directly related to how soluble it is in their digestive system. It looks as if most other folks have left the webinar at this point, so thank you all to those of you who are still here, and I uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you on January 14th when we will have a presentation about in untangling food safety uh, regulations for those who are um, growers and producers. So uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Please do go to our Survey Monkey, and thank you very much for joining us. And I'll echo that. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time.